You are listening to another Always Moto production. The Always Moto Podcast with your host, David Hogan. We talk moto events from around the world. All the injuries, all the training ins and outs, the bikes, parts and gear inspections. The results, we interview your favourite riders. It's the Always Moto Podcast. We occasionally have some coarse language and the odd stuff up along the way. If you don't like it or you don't agree with us, turn it off right now. I'd like to remind you that he is not a doctor. That's right, Moto fans. I'm not a doctor, but you know what? I am a physiotherapist, and this is episode 113 of the Always Moto podcast, proudly brought to you by Lee at Moto Australia and Technic Motorsport. I'm your host, David Hogan. Thanks for joining us here in the depths of the clinic. We throw strapping tape anywhere it will stick because that's what physios do, apparently. And as always on this show, we'll go through things that are all about moto, particularly the injuries in our sport and the fitness and recovery of those injuries and just the fitness to be able to do what we do on a motorcycle because hashtag injuries are a part of moto, but so is that recovery and training aspects. This week's show, we're going to check in with Wildcat Gas Gas Rider and the team motor lorenzo lacurcio we're going to catch up some of the announcements during the last week or so while the amateurs have been on at loretta lynn's so it's going to be a bit of a shorter show we're not going to have the usual emergency department segment we're not going to have a diatribe we're not going to have a product inspection we're going to just check up with a few things and then head straight to the interview with lorenzo so it's going to be a good show no matter what it will be a little shorter but it's still going to be a great show But hey, Moto fans, this episode, it is brought to you by Liat Moto Australia, the ultimate in gear and protection solution for riders seeking top-notch safety and style. From head to toe, Liat Moto has you covered with innovative helmets, goggles, body armor, and more. Ride with confidence knowing you're backed by gear designed by riders for riders. Head over to liatmoto.com.au and gear up for your next ride. And don't forget that this show is supported by Technic Motorsport, Pivot Pegs, Slantboard Guy, Competitive Edge Performance, Endurance Recovery Boots and Tech 167 3D Printing. Now, you'll hear about those ones at different times, but you can also find out more about them in the show notes or in the bios on our socials. There's links to get to them. And all the discount codes that go along with those sites that are linked to us are in those show notes as well. So check that out, but use those links to get there to do your purchases to help support the Always Moto podcast. Now, if you want to support the Always Moto podcast, other than that, you can buy a T-shirt from us. They are $25 plus postage and handling. And they can be purchased via emailing us at info at alwaysmoto.com. Put T-shirt or in that subject line. We'll sort that out. Details of a payment and everything will come back via PayPal. Now, if you don't want a T-shirt, that's fine. You can just donate via the PayPal account on those links as well. Um, So check out the links in the bio. Send us a donation via the PayPal account and help us continue to do what we do here at Always Moto. All right, let's jump into this show. Hi there, my name is Eldon Baker and I'm from the Baker's Factory and you're listening to Always Motor. All right, guys and girls, welcome in to episode 113 of the Always Moto podcast. We're going to get into our general talk segment here right off the bat. Uh, thanks to Technic Motorsport for that. Now, obviously, there's been not too much happening this week other than the amateur nationals at Loretta Lynn's for the AMA side of things. We are coming off the back of Lommel that just happened for the MXGP side of things and Toowoomba the week before for the Australian Ospro MX side of things as well. But obviously we like to talk about a little bit of everything here and there, but we're going to just check in on a few little storylines from across a couple of different series here as we head towards the next main race that we'll be focusing into, which will be Unadilla for round nine of the AMA motocross series, which is making up obviously part of the super motocross championship series over there. And things are going to get busy in that side of it from the moment they hit the ground with Unadilla, then it's Bud's Creek. Then it is uh, Ironman for the finale. I believe there is one week. Let me double check that. Yes, I believe there is one week and then there will be the Super Motocross playoffs from uh, when we start heading around. What do I can't even remember where those venues are, but I know we finish in Las Vegas. So uh, it's going to be a busy 
what will that be, six rounds in seven weeks coming up here shortly. So uh, still a lot of racing to go there in the AMA side of things. But let's talk about what's going to come up in the next few rounds. Some things that have been announced, Ken Roxon and HEP Suzuki got out in front and announced that Kenny's going to be back for Unadilla, as we suspected. He's back from that knee fracture, the tibial plateau fracture and broken toe and a few other bits and pieces that went on for him. Uh, he's been back on the bike for a few weeks now and he's going to be ready to go for Unadilla. So he'll be on the 450 there. But part of that announcement was quite, kind of weird, very much unexpected. Kenny announced that he's going to race Ironman as well. That's not the unexpected part. We kind of figured he'd do one, two, maybe three of the final three rounds. But the fact that he's going to do it on a 250, yes, you heard correctly, he's going to do it on a 250 class, not the 450 class. So he's going to get some extra SMX points in the 450 side of things. Probably figured out that he can get just enough points to maybe move up one position, but then can't be moved from that point if he, uh, or, you know, at least stays in the same spot with those extra points that he'll get at Unadilla. Can't go any further back, can't go any further forward, so might as well have some fun and ride the 250 at Ironman. Now, is it just a fun move? Possibly. Uh, is there any chance, now this is a long, long shot here, but is there any chance that maybe there's a sneaky idea about him riding a 250 for Motocross of Nations at the end of the year in October? That would be a turn up if he does do that, but you know, maybe he's just feeling it out to see if it's possible. I am interested to see how Ken Roxon does do when he gets on that 250. Now, of all the times to pick to drop back to the 250 class, this could be a very interesting point for Kenny because it is the final round of the championship. Everybody will have not much to really play for at that point, especially if Hayden Deegan has wrapped up the championship by that round or during that round. And so Hayden might be playing it safe in Moto 1 and then, you know, weight of the championship takes over Moto 2 and he doesn't have that top performance ability in him. Maybe the other guys are all settled into the fact that they're second, third, fourth, whatever in the championship. But there might be a little bit of a chance of a lax effort from a few guys there that gives Kenny the potential sniff that he always just needs a little bit of to get himself into the groove and maybe hold on to a podium slash win. Is that possible? I don't know. But, like, do you hear what I'm saying? Like, there's a chance that some of these guys, the field will be at its probably its weakest at that point because there'll be probably potentially another injury or two before, between now and then. There'll be lack of motivation because the championship's over and people will be thinking about bike set up and staying healthy for Super Motocross to ensure that they get points and money out of that part of the playoff series. And Kenny's a bit of a, you know, cheeky bloke in terms of he's very fast off the start, very good on a spur of a moment. Would this just all suit Kenny down to the ground and maybe he puts another podium slash win in his 250 column out of the blue i would not be surprised but i'd also not be surprised if he was fifth or worse so let's see how this plays out but very interesting news from ken roxon to announce his return to racing and part of that to be a part of the 250 class for iron man all right the other one that's popped up is Garrett Marchbanks. We talked about this a little bit on last show, speculating as to what could happen here. Well, it's been confirmed. Yes, he left Club MX Yamaha a couple of weeks ago. He is now confirmed to start his ride with Pro Circuit Kawasaki at Unadilla. He had apparently signed a deal sometime back in Supercross, and that was meant to start for 2025 season. But Garrett Marchbanks and Mitch Payton have all linked it up together to get this started early. The bike and everything is available because the equipment was sitting there doing nothing considering that Austin Faulkner, Cameron McAdoo, Seth Hamaker are all out at present. So the equipment was sitting waiting to be used by somebody. Hello, Garrett Marchbanks. Walk in, sit down, please take a ride. Uh, you can come in and go for it and he's going to be, have the chance because he's already got points from the 250 Supercross season to be a part of the Super Motocross playoffs, which is what Monster and Kawasaki want, obviously. So they are going to be able to have a third rider potentially out on track during all those Super Motocross playoffs. And for Garrett, that'll be his chance to make a little bit of extra coin and get himself in good shape and very familiar with the Cowie again. Not that it's been that long for him since he was there, but get familiar with all that setup and work himself into a good position to start the 2025 Supercross season with Mitch Payton. So interested to see how that goes. Will Garrett be able to just jump in and be fifth and better? 
be interesting to see. I dare say he'll be around that fifth, six, seven mark is my estimation for Garrett's return initially. Again, come Ironman, maybe that's a little bit higher uh, if everything goes smoothly. And Garrett manages, obviously, to himself to stay healthy as well. So a bit to watch out for there. Now, on that, with this Super Motocross playoff system now in place in the AMA series, it's making a bit of a shift in two ways for me. One is that this is encouraging riders to return from injury quicker and actually participate in the motocross series if they got injured towards the end of Supercross to actually make their returns during motocross at some point in an effort to continue to get points towards their seeding into the Super Motocross or at least qualify for the Super Motocross playoffs. And that's a good thing because it means that these riders for the promoters and for the fans are out on track, being more available, more visual than they previously were in an injury circumstance, which is great. And I think that's part of the general intention of Super Motocross was to get the stars back out on track more often than not. But the other thing that I feel that it's starting to do, and I'm not sure if this is good or bad thing, but there's going to need to be a bit of a look at how contracts are being written, worded and dated in terms of how this has played out in terms of Garrett Marchbanks, even think Colt Nichols a little bit here. Um, And even last year, guys were switching teams to get rides that would actually go to Super Motocross playoffs because not all of their rides were designed around qualification in that initially when that first series was announced. Now, is this going to be a trend? Will we see guys who are signed with, have made deals partway through 20, you know, through a season for the next season with a different team potentially being ousted by their current team and then picking up their deal early with the new team to be able to be a part of the Super Motocross Series. And look, that's not a bad thing. That means that the star, the rider themselves, the star, the, the fan favourite, is able to be a part of that series and be out there, make money, have their fans see them in action, all that sort of thing. That's great. But is there a risk that we start burning, cutting off, you know, um, pissing off some sponsors in the sense that the rider that was signed for them is cut early and then out there under the banners of somebody else. I think there needs to be a little bit of a review of this now that especially the season has the second running of it and it seems to be, it looks like it's going to be here for a long time, which is great. And the money side of things is great. But we need to make sure that the contracts that are written are not enforced. Enforced is the wrong word, but you know, committed to from both parties side of things that the rider and that the team commit to con- seeing out that contract and not ending it based on the fact that they think that maybe the rider isn't performing well enough because they've got this other ride lined up and they don't care anymore. I don't want to see these things chopping and changing and, you know, people getting left out in the, out in the lurch. I, I, I feel like we've got to just pay attention to this. This could be an issue in years to come if something isn't sorted out with it fairly soon so yeah be interested to see i'd interested to talk to a you know a writer manager an agent at this point to see what they're doing differently if anything yet in regards to playoffs and you know the super motocross playoffs and the contract wordings around that whether that's even just in financial bonuses but also whether the you know the contract is got different clauses to ensure that these things are played out as they intended at the time of signatures being laid on paper. All right. In other news, Australian Supercross news now. Now, our series in the Australian Supercross is kicking off later in October. So we're just over two months away from starting that season. And the signing news is already happening. Uh, Matt Moss has made an announcement this week. He had been riding with a local team on a gas gas to try and get some fitness up for the out for the supercross series by doing taking part in the outdoors which is something he's sort of had an inconsistent completion of over the previous few years since his return from his little hiatus um but he was riding that gas privateer gas gas team now i thought that that might have ended up being the ride for him in supercross as well but it seems that that is not the case he has signed with cdr yamaha he has signed with probably the top long-standing, if not the top, uh, between it's between uh, Honda and Yamaha in Australia, but they are the, one of the most professional teams in our in our competition here in, in our series in Australia. 
So I was a little bit shocked to see that he'd signed with those guys. Obviously, Jed Beaton is there currently. Uh, Dean Ferris is there with him for the outdoors. He's not really a Supercross guy anymore, and he's also injured. Um, kind of thought there was a chance that maybe Aaron Tanty might come back to ride that series with his old team, CDR. Uh, but it seems that Matt Moss has got the, got the call in for this one, uh, which is potentially a very good signing. Matt's been in the hunt with these races the last two seasons really, really well. Um, yes, last season sort of ended a bit bumpy with his Newcastle crashes and injuries, but he's been competitive. So I can see why uh, Craig Dack there has probably taken a chance to grab Matt Moss on his team and try and get another rider in the fight for the championship to try and challenge, you know, the defending champ, Dean Wilson, uh, who will be with... Your Eve's Honda team there. So interesting signing. Uh, interested to see how that plays out in the Supercross series later in October. Now, continuing with the Australian Supercross news, they've put out some information around the CR85CC Cup and the SX3 classes for 2024 and the fact that the last two last season when this all kicked off for those two classes – They were a bit of an exhibition class, not necessarily a championship class. Well, for 2024, they are in fact now championship status. So for the competitors in those classes, the 85s and the SX3s, SX3 being 14 years to 18 years, I believe, if I remember that information correctly, they will now have the chance to become the Australian champ in said class. So that's a bit of a step up for them and obviously give a little bit more clout to them when they're chasing sponsors and rides in the future as well. So good to see that the promoters there for Australian Supercross are taking the chance to bump up these statuses because they are part of the series and the entire series at each week. So good to see that that's happening there as well. Some industry news now. Uh I teased it last week. It's still being teased this week. The Liat 2025 motocross range will be out mid-August. So we are less than two weeks away from seeing the new colors. I have seen them. I have got the catalog. I have got an order in already for myself and the team here with the, with the wife, Mrs. Always Moto, and the two kids. Um, we've obviously had that Liat deal in place. The gear has been sensational this year. And this year, this 2025 range will be nothing short of sensational as well. So it's coming out very, very soon. Keep an eye on the socials. You'll see their posts promoting it. You'll even get a sneak peek on some of the colors if you check out some of the riders that were at Loretta Lynn's and the Red Bull Romaniacs recently with Johnny Walker. Um, You'll see some of the 2025 colors in there. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, So check that out. There's some... Very cool colorways coming here. Uh, My daughter's very stoked on one in particular. So you'll see that here in the near future. So check out Liat, obviously part of the Always Moto podcast, but they've got some really good gear that you should be protecting yourself with and just wearing to your races uh, in 2020, end of 2024, 2025. And of course, big news. I've got more big news. Malcolm Stewart's been out fishing during the break. It's not really massive news, but you know, I saw it on the, I saw it on Instagram the, uh, today, this morning before I was getting prepped. He's holding up a big fish that he's caught. He's obviously had a big, big time on the boat in the week or so off that he's had already, uh, just enjoying himself. He's obviously still training and riding, but he's got a bit of extra time on the weekends because they're not traveling to the races. So he's taken that opportunity to go and have a good fish. And good on you, Malcolm, for enjoying life as a professional racer. Now, as a professional racer, what do the factory teams from like Honda, Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha, what do they have in common? Well, they use either KYB or Showa suspension, and they service them with genuine parts. Now, KYB and Showa, they have an Australian distributor, and that's Technic Motorsport in Sydney. Now, why would you use non-genuine seals, wipers, bushes, and other consumables when genuine parts are available? They perform better and are usually only a day away. Technicmotorsport.com is the place to go for your genuine KYB and shower components from seals to fork tubes to individual internal components and A-kit suspension kits for KYB and shower. You can get the whole KYB A-kit from Technic. It's awesome. They have everything there at Technic. They can, if you're on their website, use the Find My Bike tool to see the compatible parts. And, of course, new parts are always being added to the website. So there's more and more. So you should be checking back on that regularly. If you're not in Australia, that's okay. 
Technic has a currency converter and shipping calculator on their site and they ship daily with DHL to most countries. So you can get all your stuff from technicmotorsport.com. Check it out if you haven't already. All right, I think that's all we're going to get to here for our general talk segment, thanks to Technic Motorsport. Let's uh, take a quick break on the show. We're going to come back and we're going to jump straight into our interview with Lorenzo Lucercio. Hey, this is Dominic Thurry. You are listening to the Always Moto Podcast. All right, guys and girls, joining us on the Always Moto Podcast this week. It's the number 60 riding the Wildcat Gas Gas. Uh, it's Lorenzo Lucercio. How are we doing, Lorenzo? We're doing good, man. It's been a while since we catched up, so I'm excited to talk a little bit and yeah, catch up. Yeah, we've obviously had you on the show before. But last time I, I spoke to you was when I was there in person at Redbud. We did the post-race interviews and things were going pretty good at that point. And yeah, obviously it's over a year since we've spoken really. So nice to hear your voice again and, and have you out and about on the on the circuit doing your thing with Wildcat, mate. Yeah, it, uh, it's a different face for sure in my career right now uh, where I'm doing like a lot more than I anticipated and I thought even, but you know, I'm embracing it. I'm liking it. And it's just a challenge. So I'm tackling as as bad as I can, as best as I can. Sorry. Yeah. Well, let's start there actually seeing as we've sort of ended up there naturally, like you're saying you got lots on your plate, the wildcat team, you are essentially wildcat, aren't you? Like it's your team, but you've got some family support. I think you're mentioning before we hit record here to sort of get you through the, the day to day, the week to week and make sure that the, you know, the truck turns up at each race sort of thing. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all me, you know, it started, um, last year, uh, the outdoor season, um, I was coming from injuries. I didn't really have like a good offer, uh, to right here in the States after my MXGP, uh, trip. So, you know, we we're putting numbers together and I've, I was talking to some sponsors back home and, and like even back in Europe and they were like, dude, why don't you just start your own deal? And then that's just kind of like the final push. I've been a privateer for a lot of years. I've been like in a lot of privateer efforts and I know what they lack. Uh, so yeah, I just try to do my own thing. Uh, I know what I can count with. I'm a writer myself. I know what the priority needs to be. Um, so yeah, we've been juggling with that. Uh, Lucky enough, my parents like dirt bikes and motocross more than I do, I believe. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's pretty nice. My mom's the team manager, so she handles everything that needs to be done with like uh, scheduling, like paying mechanics, uh, plane tickets, hotels, uh, talking to the AMA, all that, that stuff that I don't like so much. And then me and my dad take care of everything like – functionally uh we make sure the rig is good to go we make sure it's everything stacked uh all the parts everything that needs to be done i take care of that during the week uh on the weekends my dad's like my eyes uh you know i i take them enough uh, I, you know i drift away enough from my training during the week where like in the weekends i just want to focus on racing while I'm still doing it so he does a lot for me too uh you know, also my mechanics and uh, truck driver, everyone, you know, they do a good job uh, taking everything afloat and helping me out, you know, understanding that I'm also a rider. So uh, it's a lot going on, but, you know, I got a great group of people helping um, on the daily. Yeah, definitely. Like, obviously, it takes a lot more than just one person to be able to make sure that, you know, the truck's there, the parts are there, the bike is actually prepped. You know, just so that you can turn up and not have your head in 50,000 places and actually concentrate on, I've got to put a fast lap in and qualifying and I've got to pick this gate for a decent start and all that sort of stuff. Like, there must be a lot that you are glad that your parents are probably taking away from you so you can just focus on actually running, you know, a good race at some point on, on the weekend. Yeah, and like last year we did it with Butron, like the team. Yep. Uh, he was a rider for us, so it was easy because he was in a 450 class, so... You know, the, these bikes uh, are super reliable. They're really, really good. Uh, but outdoor is grueling. So for last year, we got lucky. We never had, like, mechanical. We never had any issues, like, big big issues. So uh, it wasn't stressful like that. But then this year, you know, uh, we picked up Evan Ferry and we did the 250 class for outdoors uh, as first time for me ever doing outdoors as a, like, 
me doing it because I did it in my rookie year in 2017. Uh, so we had a lot of issues that year too. So I was like super skeptical doing it. Uh, luckily, Gas Gas uh, provided us with like a really good platform and then Twisted Development built really, really good motors, super reliable. You, w- you wouldn't believe how reliable those engines are and how fast they are. But like everything machine wise, they break. So, mm-hmm. and they, I feel like they came all together. Like I was in the, in the, I was at the gate for Southwick for Moto Two. Yep. And uh, Tom Guyon came over to race in one of our bikes, like under an awning and everything. So we gave him support for that. Yep. Uh, his bike blew up in one of the races. Uh, uh, and so, like, I'm literally about to go out for me to race, and then I'm seeing the guy push it. So I'm like running over to him, making sure like everything that happened was fine or what what was going on. Uh, so yeah, then I had to tell him like even where the en- the spare engine was, everything was. So, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. I was doing that before 20 minutes before I went out racing myself. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely different. Like for example, for Evan. Uh, we had a motor issue for Washugo, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just like I'm literally 40 minutes from like starting my moto because it happened second qualifying. We went first, then the 250, yep. and I'm literally helping them strip out the bike because we had a we have a fully prepped spare bike, uh, so we had to take the engine out for it to put on his race bike. Uh-huh. Uh, so you're there on the tools. so I'm literally helping. <laughs> yeah, I'm literally literally like. In my gear, helping uh, the mechanic just to you know speed things up, uh, take the engine apart while I'm getting ready to go out and motor myself. So, uh, just a lot of things that people don't see that go behind doors. That it just takes a lot more than I even anticipated, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, it's just crazy, crazy things to happen. And I mean, everyone their own issues. And if these are my issues, then I'm. I feel like I'm pretty lucky just to be in that position, just to be there and have a team, have good riders, and yeah, just puzzle. That's what it's life about. <laughs> yeah, look, you could just be the the rider complaining about the fact that the bike blew up, but you're actually the you know the man there trying to put it all back together. So it's um, there's more hats to this than just being a rider these days for you, which is awesome. And I gather that like you've obviously got this far with the team. You know, like you said, you've had some guys come over and ride with you. You've now got Evan Ferry. Is this this plan that you've got going here with Wildcat? Like, is this your foreseeable future of this is where you're riding and that for you know the next couple of years whilst you feel that you can continue to do it? Yeah, for sure. Like I said, for me, it's not worth it to be in like on a small level team uh, and nothing against them. Like I'm I'm living it myself, so I know it's hard. I understand now the other side of the the fence where before I was like the rider only. So I was like, oh, like complaining about this, complaining about that. Mm. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard to find funding. It's hard to, like, make everyone happy. Like, you know, everyone is everyone, everyone is their own head, you know, their own personality, their own. Like, I have to learn this because, like, this year is the first time I have employees on the team because last year it was all, like, friends uh, that were helping me doing mechanic. Like, they were mechanics, but they were helping me out. Like, yeah. I wasn't paying them. So... Uh, this year is a lot different. Like we're more serious. Uh, like we got employees, we got that. So it just takes a lot, you know. Like like I said, everyone is their own head. Like everyone has their own personality. Like I can't treat everyone the same. Uh, meaning like everyone is a little bit like approaches a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I, of course I treat everyone the same, but like different approaches. So uh, yeah, it's uh, trust me. Every every day is something new. Like every day is. Uh, <laughs> It's it's like a, a Pandora box. You open it, you don't know what's coming out. So yeah, uh, well, you don't probably you probably just like want it some days just to go to the test track and do your laps and you know go home. But I'm sure that there's a phone call or three that pop up even on the way to the track for you, and you're like, oh, I've got to deal with that before I can get this happening. And yeah, it probably just snowballs some days for you, and you just like you probably wish you were just a rider. But and on the other side of that, you've got all the the benefits of choosing all your own parts and components that are coming and the people that you're working with so yeah benefits and negatives on both sides exactly everything i feel like uh in life you got to put everything in balance you know like uh from the good and the bad like you always gotta and you always gotta look at the positive side you know even though like the world can be crashing on your feet and like like i said you just gotta 
keep going, find that that light at the end of the tunnel, and just keep chugging along. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot going on. Like I said, uh, sometimes, dude, like I'm not gonna lie, I even forget to email stuff. Like I even forget to re- respond to people just because, uh, you know, I'm still training, I'm still yep. trying to live a life too. So it's like balancing all that. It's been like a learning uh, curve for me, and uh, yeah, and. It's, by no means I'm perfect. By no means uh, we're the best yet, but we're for sure working for it. Yeah, that's that's good, man. But I gather some of this load is sort of probably slowing you up a little bit on track because you're probably not spending as much time just focused in on that. You, you have had a reasonable 2024, but I think 2023 was a bit better for you in, you know, in that initial phase. Um, last round at Washougal, I think, was your best individual moto score in moto two there. I think you got 15th. Um how has this year compared to last year? Like, like we said, the results maybe not as good, but um, you know, you're still out there on track, still scoring some points. Yeah, I mean, last year was, I feel like the final year for me. Um, you know, because during the week I got the speed to run where I was running last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the field was a little more depleted than this year. This year is like stacked, but at the same time. Uh, you know, I was where I was. Like, you just have to be there every weekend where like this week, like this year, I haven't been there every weekend to my full potential. Like, it's just frustrating and apart and like just everything else going on, like the team, myself, like injuries, like try to recoup, like try to still get training. Cause like last year uh, in Southwick, uh, that that was like my last race last Mm -hmm. year. I got landed on and like I tore my shoulder up and it's just like, you, it was never the same. Like I had to change my riding. I had to like, cause it's just not strong yet. Even to this day, like, it's just weird. Like that ligament I broke, it's like super sensitive. And like, it's like the doctor said, like, uh, maybe I was going to be able to ride or maybe I wasn't going to be able to ride anymore. Cause like he put it back together, but he just didn't yeah, seem confident that it was strong point. enough. Yeah. Yeah. He's just like, dude, like you did a lot of damage to it. Like the, the ligaments destroy like i don't know what i all can do so so yeah it's uh like i didn't get a proper off season like i did even even last year i didn't get one for for outdoors last year but i was still able to get like a month good on the bike like mm-hmm. all uh, sil- uh firing on all cylinders like yeah full speed no pains no swellings no anything where like this year for supercross i i couldn't hit whoops because of my shoulder Till the week of Detroit, and even then, I couldn't hit him for 15 laps because then my shoulder was too weak that I was like afraid to crash again. So, uh, yeah, like even this year, you started bad from the get go, like confidence wise, too. Because, like, if I, you can't hit the obstacle, yeah. uh, it was four years since I raced Supergrass, so it just all like snowballed from there. But I was still like making like mains, and like I was 12. Uh, I was like 11 or 10th in Daytona, I think 11th. Yeah, uh, but that obviously ended badly as well. Like it, you were you were running quite high there, but yeah, obviously it didn't finish out, unfortunately. that la- It was last lap, wasn't it, for Daytona that it got you? Literally, I had two more corners and I was yeah. finished. So so yeah, like I said, I, uh, as soon as I was catching momentum, I was finally, my fitness level was there. Like my uh, – confidence was getting there like i was feeling comfortable again on the bike you know i just got that big get up that you know it didn't take me out long but it was me more being like a meathead and being dumbass and just not taking the right uh you know rest to come back i rushed it like a lot and so yeah like i hit my head pretty good like i didn't get a concussion like i don't know how like the 60 helmet's amazing but unfortunately, like my face got pretty tore up. Like I had like a broken nose. Like I, I, they had to like stitch me up. Uh, I had like a bruised lung, broken uh, ribs. Uh, you know, like I, I broke one of the tips in my vertebrae. So like, you know, it's just like a lot going on. Like I, I was like a lot in pain. But then luckily, like, dude, out of nowhere, like I woke up one day and I had like no pain. Um, that's, so that, that's what I thought I was good. And yeah. then, but my eye that's what's been like the most difficult my eye it's just been like super sensitive to light like it's just been weird like it's just one of these injuries that like, i have to take time off but i didn't do it so like i it just been catch up and then not only that but when i came back i dabbed my knee i twisted it pretty good 
the same knee I got surgery last year uh, before the season started. Yeah. So I've been dealing, I've been dealing with like a lot of inflammation, a lot of like fluids. Like I've been draining the knee nonstop. So, uh, so yeah, like I said, this year hasn't been ideal for me training wise. Uh, so the like some sometimes I I don't even ride for weeks. Like I, <laughs> like last week I was only able to ride two times, and then like I was out all weekend because my knee was like so swollen. So, uh. so yeah, it's just. You know, it's if it's not one thing, it's another. So, we patience is it was not my thing. Now it's becoming a thing because, like I said, now I got a baby. I can't train the way I want to. It's just it's just a lot going on. So that's why my results to circle back to yeah. how my twenty four was or my my season has been so far. It's been you know pretty far away from where I know I can be and where I want to be. But this is the cards I've been dealt with and now we're, we're like pushing through it. We're doing whatever we can. Like, like I said, I can't do much motos. I can't do much riding days just because, uh, you know, physically I can't do it. But at the same time, like last week, I felt like it was one of the hottest races of the year. The track was pretty brutal, like meaning choppy and like mm-hmm. just gnarly. And then like, yeah, I was inbound to be my, like a really, really good weekend. Honestly, like first moto, I was around 18, like third lap. And then, uh, yeah, my hand got broke and with it took my lever, like it just all came apart and like my lever fell off, my yeah, front great. brake lever. Yeah. So I was like 25 minutes uh, without a front brake in Washougal with all those hills and all that. Uh, it was quite sketchy. So I managed a 25 there. And then second moto, I started okay. Like I didn't have the best gate pick. Like I, I should have gone more outside, but I didn't. And, uh yeah, like uh, you know when the you drop off after the horsepower hill, did you do a U turn yes. to go back up? Yep. Uh, I I landed that jump and something happened with my bike. It just bogged and like shut off, and then it wouldn't want to start. So I'm like, oh great, like here we go. So I'm <laughs> dead last, and then I'm just like, well, what the heck? Like I'm just gonna push till I I can't go no more. And then luckily, like I I made it all the way through 15. Uh, so yeah, like it was a really, really good moto. Like I felt finally, uh, you know, I could do whatever I wanted on the bike playing with the track. So, uh, been trying to carry this momentum for the last three, hopefully make it to SMX. If not, then it just gave me more time to get ready for next season. Yeah. Well, look that you've sort of completely explained. I was going to go and say like, are you a hundred percent, you know, from those things that you've gone on, but clearly what you've just said says that you, you're working through all this still. And that then obviously explains a little bit of these results side of things, because you're just not able to have a consistent routine week to week in terms of, you know, the training load, the the bike time, the ability to push on race day, whatnot. So yeah, it's, it gives a good picture of where you're at in 2024 but then i guess the next part of this is like with the knee swelling up with with the the shoulder or the eye like is any of this stuff going to need to have something done to you know a bit more specifically in the off season so you can be you know potentially better again come 2025 supercross luckily no so just need a couple like of weeks of my not shoulder- racing <laughs> yeah they just my shoulder it is it is what it is like yeah. uh, they can't do anything more about it you know like uh and I, i've been i've been learning i've been like you know i've been doing everything i can like don't get me wrong i've been doing everything i can then now it's a lot better yep um uh, but for sure it will never be the same like it will never be as strong as it was before or like it never will mm-hmm. so i just adapted took me a long time to get used to it for sure um but yeah, my knee, like I got an MRI, my ACL is good and all that, but the doctor wants to check himself the 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 image because I got like a, the image somewhere else and they didn't send them the CD, so I have to do that. But I don't think so. Like, uh, you know, everything feels strong. Like it doesn't move too much. Uh, so it just, it's built up with so much fluid that it just, like it just gives it out or just like pops out, but the ACL is good. So that's mm. my biggest worry. All the others, it's like a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> Hopefully maybe you've just got I, something like loose floating around that's irritating and continuing to cause that fluid. Cause like the fluid wouldn't be there if there was nothing going on. You know what I mean? Like it, there's something irritating it to, to cause it to, to swell all the time or at least, you know, and maybe that's what you'll find when he looks at the images a little bit 
closer himself that there's just one little fragment somewhere that's you know enough to irritating and he takes that out and you know miraculously the swelling stops do you know what i mean yeah i mean hopefully that's the case to be honest because i'm a pretty high pain tolerance guy like i i've raised with many broken bones i've I've raised with like torn acls i've torn shoulders (laughs) I've, I've, i've raised with everything you can imagine i've done it uh but this pain, man, like this is like bone to bone bruising. Like it just like, like I can't sleep at night some days. Like, hey, trust me, like right now I'm fine. Like I, I got no pain right now, but yeah. I could wake up tomorrow and I could barely walk. I could barely like do anything. So that's how gnarly it changes from like time to time. So it's just funny. Like Friday, I went for a cycle, nice and easy, just recovery ride, like yeah. nothing crazy, no hills, no anything. Uh, and then I did a workout. And then after that workout, dude, it swelled up so much that all Saturday I was in bed. Like I couldn't do yeah. anything. Like it was all elevated. Like yeah. it just gnarly. And then, and then Sunday it was fine. So it's like, man. Yeah. But see that, that, that like little bit of irritation that just throws out your ability to pro- progress quickly. Like you can't do a repeat day of training. You know, you have to have a full day of rest. You're sort of just losing that momentum in, in your training adaptions so yeah it's sort of just slowing you down a little bit but yeah obviously something's just irritated in there and being a problem pain in your ass basically or pain in your knee i should say <laughs> yeah and like uh, and like i said it's every time i'm carrying momentum it's like i can never build it up to where i want and you know our sport is about confidence and you know when i i know i can't push 100 percent because i'm like afraid i'm gonna do more damage to the knee or like it's gonna pop out or something like that Mm, yeah, not a good spot to be it. No, nah, it just changes the way I ride. So that's why we've been working. Like I, I am now with Eric Sorby training. So he's been helping a lot, like technique wise, trying to find solutions how we can change it up to put like the least amount of effort on it, but still get training. Because like, like I said, hot, brutal summer here in America. Like everyone's going super fast. So. I mean, you can tell I'm I'm off, like I'm not 100%, and you can tell how much of a difference it is. Yeah, it's just enough to pop you just towards the back end of that points there, isn't it, whereas you probably would have been close to the 10th in, in a lot of these circumstances. So, yeah, frustrating, but something to work through and, and you know, continue to sort of sort out, hopefully for, you know, a good tilt next year in 2025. Now, you mentioned that you're training with, like, or is it just Eric that's doing the, the like, on-bike stuff for you? Is he looking after your fitness and training program as well? No. So, uh, for the fitness side of things, I'm doing troll training. Uh, oh, nice. You know, I've, I've trained with Alex even before he started troll training. Like, uh, you know, it was kind of like it started as a joke with <laughs> us, like, just, like, Oh, so fit this and that, like with John Wesley too. Uh, so it's just a, a really good fit for me. Like I'm super comfortable with John and uh, Alex. So it was nice for me when I was struggling in Supercross just to like rely on them when I was like needing help. So as soon as I called, they didn't hesitate. They had a program for me right then. So it's super easy. You know, I just wake up, I look at my uh, training peaks. I know what to do. If I have any questions, I can just reach out to them. They're yeah. like right there. Most of the time they're always available. Uh, so it's super nice for me. It's uh, mentally it's super nice just to be known that they know what they're doing. It's proven like I've done it many, many years. So uh, yeah, it's easy. And then after Supercross, that opportunity came uh, with uh, Eric to start working together. Uh, he moved down here again from Tallahassee back to Orlando area. So so yeah, it just became a, a really, really nice uh, business relationship we got right now. Yep. So uh, he's, he's helped a, t- a ton. Just like it's it's nice, you know, because having an extra set of eyes. Because between him and my dad, like they brainstorm a lot, and they just you know they just tell me how it is. Like Eric is a super straightforward guy. Like he, there's no like sugar coating, no bullshit. Like. <laughs> uh, and that's and that's what you need, you know, because like it's nice to have that guy that always gonna like tell you how great you are. Mm. But then when when stuff is going down and like you need like some like to wake up, it's nice to have that one person that no matter what is gonna tell you, hey, if it's good, it's good. But if it sucks, it sucks. So, yeah. um, you know, it's uh, it's nice because 
you know, family, it's different because they always will want the best for you. So my dad, my mom, they're always like straightforward with me. But to have someone that's like not family and be able to like do stuff like that, it's pretty amazing. It just speaks his character, his standards. Uh, you know, it's it's just great. Uh, we we meshed, we gelled really good. Like, uh, you know, I lived in France, so. Uh, it's it's just nice. Like I, I've known him for a long time because he used to be a trainer for a Honda team that was based out of the butt racing, uh, like the same area the butt racing guys yeah. were. So, mm-hmm. uh, so I've known him for a long time. Like it's just I'm comfortable around them. I can be myself. I don't have to worry about anything else. Just put the trust on him. And then, like I said, he he does a lot. Like he just pinpoints a lot, works on the track, he gets creative. And like I said, he's just a fresh like breath of air that I feel like I needed for a long time just to kind of like take the guessing out of the equation. Like I, like I mentioned, same thing with pretty much with Alex and John and pro training. Yeah. That's what Eric does. Like he takes the guessing out of it. Like I got a lot going on and it's just nice to show up on the track. He has the program. He has everything. Uh, him and my mechanic, like they get the the lap times, everything like Eric is just looking on the, on the track. Like, and it's nice. Cause like, uh, I like to like explore a lot on the track. I like to like jump bumps and stuff. And he's like, Hey, what do you think here? What do you think that? So we try and a lot, like most of the time it doesn't work, but it's cool. So, uh, you know, we do it and it just keeps it fun. You know, it's just different. Sounds like you've got a good relationship there with, with Eric and obviously Alex and John Westling as well. But yeah, the, to have somebody, like you said, tell you straight that maybe your technique is, is off there rather than just saying, yeah, yeah, you're perfect. That's, you know, that's the only way to progress in this sport is to have somebody to be really able to critique you, but respect you and you respect them. So yeah, if you've got that with, with Eric, that's, you know, something you, you know, you need to keep working with. So no, it sounds like a, a nice arrangement for you, but Talking about that training stuff there, and obviously if, if, if John and Alex are sorting you out there with that troll training side of things, these questions might be easy because they might already have it all down for you. But we, we've talked a little bit with a lot of the interviews we've done recently with some of these guys here in the pro ranks about their training loads that they're doing during season but also pre-season to sort of get an idea for everybody out there. The effort loads that go into these you know races and seasons for you guys – do you know what it is week to week in terms of like an hour number that you're you're getting for it, you know, during the season? Obviously at the moment it might be a little bit scattered or reduced because of the things you said you're dealing with, but normal circumstances, do you know what sort of hours you're putting in weekly during the season? Yeah, so some weeks I have like 13 hours, 11 hours, nine hours of training, but some other weeks I have like four hours, three hours, just just depends like right now like what we what i'm dealing sometimes i'm just doing dirt bike you know i'm yeah i can't do much more because we're prioritizing what needs to be done like if uh you know if the knee is bothering and i can ride one day then i ride the day and then like i rest the other days just to try to get a, another day but a lot of days like the three four hour days it's just all bicycle like uh some weeks this season i haven't been able even to ride it during the week like i just show up to the weekend hoping for the best and that's when like a lot of stuff goes bad for me results wise just because like i'm so out of touch with my dirt bike but to be honest i haven't done an off season like a proper off season t- since 2021 so yeah uh it's just been a long time like i need a lot of base training i need a lot of like strength training uh but you know it is what it is. This is a car I'm dealt with and that's my training load pretty much. That's what you're working through at the moment. So yeah, no, that's fair enough. And what about like when you are doing the cardio side of things and you mentioned this one before we record, but we'll see what your actual response is here. But what is the favorite type of cardio for you? If you had to pick, you know, of all the things, which one are you going to, to do the cardio on? Honestly, I hate cycling. Yep. That's what I'm just going to put that out there. (laughs) Yep. So what I is the favorite cycling. one then? <laughs> uh, I don't think I have a favorite one, to be honest. I mean, I can't run because of my knees, so yep. scratch that other equation. Uh, I like swimming a lot. Uh, yeah. It's just different, you know. Yeah. It just takes a, a bit like a rhythm. Um, but also, like, even though I hate cycling, I do it because I use it as my own therapy. Like, I, 
I used to just to clear my mind, just to like stop thinking about everything that goes on in the day to day. So, and then also like I can't go with like a lot of people cycling because like if they're, which is not too hard to be better than me in the bicycle, just <laughs> selling yourself short here, I think because. a little bit, but yeah, yeah, go on. Um, so like if I go with a lot of people, my heart rate is always like out of the zones, like it's always higher. I have a higher heart rate anyways like okay. i i can get up on the dirt bike i can get it up to like 215 easy during oh, really? the moto yeah. so yeah. yeah so i use cycling my friends always get pissed off at me goes like oh dude like you never tell me or like even like training guys like oh like you ever cycle i'm like i do but i go on alone like i'm like a lone wolf when i cycle just because first of all my training like i the little training i can do while i can do it like i've been doing I take it super seriously because that's the only window I got. Like I, I, it's not like I've been, I have like an off season. So like, I, I gotta, I can't be like, let's say I gotta do a zone two mm. bike ride. I can't be zone five. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah. not going to do me any good. So, uh, I'd rather go alone, keep up, like keep on looking at my sounds, like just clear my mind, listen to good music and just like relax. Yeah. Seems- but yeah, I'd say, Seeing as, seeing as you've just mentioned that too, because I br- this one comes up often with the cycling, like your road cycling, I gather. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. And then, so you've got, uh, I gather from if you listen to good music, you've got the 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 pods in the ears um, whilst you're road cycling. Yep, yep. That's 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 pretty much it. You know, like I, I, I just like I said, I I can't like I would like to go training with the boys, you know, cause the boys during the week, they're like, Oh, we're cycling tomorrow, this and that. I'm like, I just stay quiet. Cause I don't want to go and be 160, 170 while they're doing 105, 110 heart rate. So, yeah, um, right. is you know, that just sometimes it goes, is that just cause you're not like, yeah, as some, strong in the cycle part of it in terms of, you know, the speeds you're able to, con- to do or the purely that they do more frequency. So obviously you're not, you know, capable of doing that at the minute. No, like the funny part is I, I keep up. Like I it's like yeah, my heart is 170, 180, 190, whatever you want to call it, yeah. but I keep up. Like I and I can be talking to them and I'm like not out of breath. Like, you know, like I I can keep up, but just the my heart rate is just high. Like right now, wow. probably right now I'm at a hundred. Like we're talking and I'm like at a hundred. So uh You're just an exciting like I said, man by the sounds of it, because I'm sitting here talking to you at seventy five, so you know <laughs> so. Yeah, well, uh, I'm I'm doing the breathing now, and I'm like 95, 94. It's coming down, but like I said, I'm I'm 90, 93, 94 right now. So yeah, like I'm 20 beats higher than you, and we're doing the same thing. So see, and see, this is uh, where people don't always get the understanding that your heart rate is your own, and that there's other people that can do the, exactly the same activity, but have a very different range of what they're going to have their heart rate at to do that same activity. And unless you understand that, like you've figured out for the rides, you've got to control it for you. It doesn't matter what they're doing. You've got to control it for you if you want to progress your your cardio strength along. So yeah, obviously by you taking away, you know, the ability to go ride with some with with the with the boys all the time, but it means that you're getting a more effective workout. Yep. And that's exactly and like trust me, you got no idea how many days me and John fought over the phone because he's like, dude, I told you it's a zone two ride. And then he looks at my data and I'm like, zone four, zone five, the whole two hours. <laughs> and he's like, dude, like this is not beneficial. And I'm like, dude, what do you want me to do? Like I'm going with Alex back when he was racing and I'm going with, you know, whoever, like, what do you want me to do? I got to keep up. Like I can't just let him like drop me just because my heart is high. So that's when I was like, you know what? Like you're right. If I want to progress my fitness level, I got to do what's right for me. And, and, you know, everyone understands that, you know, like Kenny, he's really big into, into like fitness. Like he's really, really, really good at like fitness. Mm -hmm. Like he knows so much, like Chase knows a lot too. So it's like, you know, you got all these riders that know a lot more than I do. So they understand when I tell them like, dude, I can't go because of this or because of that. So now you know, I don't even get an invite anymore because they know I can't go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like he's not going to reply. He's just not coming. He knows what he's doing. We, we'll just leave him be. Yep. Uh, yeah. So like, like at the beginning, I felt like they thought I was just a jerk that I didn't like people. And I didn't want to go with them. But like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just the way it is. You know, I can't, 
like I can't do it, you know. I I just I could do it, but it's not beneficial for me. No, definitely. And that's what you want to obviously you're putting the time in to do it. You want to make sure it's actually benefiting you to the as much as possible that it can be. So yeah, I can understand why you're doing that uh, completely. So no, that's very interesting. But I have to go back to the bit with the, the, uh, the pods in the ears and the music. Do you ever get concerned that you can't hear what's coming up behind you? Cause I, I'm a, I'm a person that just cycles in my own, you know, nothing on i'm just listening for what's going on around me and i zone out in that sense in terms of i'm just you know not staring off in the space but i'm paying attention to what i'm doing but that's my way of going into you know that clear of the headspace but i'm still alert to the traffic and whatnot beside me um does that ever concern you because i always worry about that massively that i wouldn't hear somebody coming up if i had a you know had something cranking in the in the ears yeah um oh Sorry, I dropped the phone. Uh, yeah, so I'm with you 100%. Luckily, where I live here in Claremont, there's a bike path. Oh, cool. And I go so slow anyway that I don't have to worry about like being just over like too fast for the bike path. Um, so, yeah, like some days, honestly, like it's about the mood. Like if I wake up and I want to go on a cycle and I feel like listening to music, I listen to music. Like I put my ear, ear, mm. earplugs on. Uh Sometimes I have it on. I have I have them on, but no music playing. Yeah, right. And then and then some days I don't have anything on. Like I like I said, I just sometimes I zoned out so bad. Like yeah, um, like you like you said, I'm still alert to my surroundings, like the cars, like in the mm-hmm. intersections and all that. Yep. But I'm zoned out so much, like just concentrating on my breathing, like my pedaling and all that, that. Sometimes I don't even like listen to the music that's playing, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, I'm quite a it's quite funny because, like, when I go, when I do go out, one of my friends, uh, he lives in, uh, close to me, he's been like a long time friend. Uh, you know, sometimes we go cycling together, and I got my ear- earphones on, and he's like, What are you listening to? and I'm like, Nothing, yeah, I'm literally just like, <laughs> I was like, I just have them on, they're there for show, so yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just so people think I'm listening, like not to bother me. So it's, it's just funny. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Well, Lorenzo, look, it's been awesome to catch up with you and check in about a few different parts of what's happening with your program in, in 2024. And obviously a few more races yet to come. You've got another week before the next next race uh, at Unadilla. Um, are you looking forward to it? Yes. Uh, like I said, I haven't raced Washougal this past two weekend, two weeks, yeah, two weekends ago, and uh, Unadilla, Butts Creek, and Ironman. I haven't raced them in like five years. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. last year I got hurt. So that's five years. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, Unadilla. I got uh, the last time I raced it, I got like a top 10. So uh, I like that track. It's just ruddy, difficult. And then Butts Creek is one of my favorites, if not my favorite one out of the schedule. Yep. Uh, and then Ironman, I raced it through in the amateurs so many times. I had like such good success. So I'm looking forward to all those three races. Uh, and then, yeah, like it's, like you said, um, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hopefully for some uh, more progressing in those results and like that 15th can be, become the norm for these next three, if not higher, you know. So, and like you said, maybe get to Super Motocross. You have to wait and see. But, um, yeah, look, good luck with the rest of the season. Thank you for being a part of the Always Moto podcast again, and um, we'll check you out on the on the weekend at Unadilla. Yep, thank you, man. Thank you for having me, and yeah, it was nice to catch up. Hey, it's Josh Cartwright, and you're listening to Always Moto Podcast. Welcome back, guys and girls. Thanks for sticking around in the Always Moto Podcast, brought to you by, in this part of the show, Pivot Pegs. And if you haven't thought about Pivot Pegs before, maybe you should. They are super wide. They do pivot. They do reduce the uh, effects on your boot soles and improve your leg positioning on the bike. So check out pivotpegs with a z.com and get yourself a set of pivot pegs. They're basically available for all dirt bikes and adventure bikes. So if you're an adventure bike guy, you can get some of these for them as well. They're, they're really good on adventure bikes, trust me. All right, it's been a great show. Thanks to Lorenzo Lecursio for joining us. It was an awesome chat with him. Really like talking to Lorenzo. Yeah, he's just a down to earth dude. Uh, easy to get information from about different things likes talking about the sport knows the sport really well obviously well connected as well and running his own show there with a team rig on the road bikes 
got Evan Ferry under the tent now as well with him. Has some spaces for some international guys to come across as well, like you mentioned throughout that. So, yeah, really good guy. Um, really appreciative of him making some time for the Always Moto podcast. But that's it. Like we said, this was a bit of a shorter show. It's still going to be about an hour by the time we kick this thing out. Uh, which is not too bad. Most of that was Lorenzo talking. And as we said, when he did, we hung up, he's like, I talk too much, man. I'm like, no, I like that. I don't want to be the one that you're listening to too often. We're interviewing you. We want to hear from you. So you talk as much as you want to talk, which is fine. So let's kick this thing out the door. Don't forget, we need to get some support here. Buy a t-shirt for Always Moto. They are $25. Email info at alwaysmoto.com and you will get your, we'll get you one of those sent out very, very quickly. You need to stay up to date with all things Always Moto. Search us on these social media channels. Um, just search Always Moto and then follow and subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast feed. If you're listening on Spotify, please get in there after this show and leave a rating on it for us. It means a lot to us um, and it helps boosting us in the you know suggested podcasts when you go to – if you don't go to your, your library, if you just go to search and then podcast, we want to show up there and that's how – the feedback side of things, the rating helps us show up there. Now, don't forget to check out our written articles over on fullnoise.com.au uh, as well as in the Motocross Network magazine. Yes, that's correct. We are in the Motocross Network magazine. I have just submitted two more articles. There'll be a third one going in. So I should have three in the next uh, edition. So check that out as well, the Motocross Network. But that's it for another show. Thanks to Lead Moto Australia, Technic Motorsport, Pivot Pegs, Competitive Edge Performance, Slantboard Guy, Endurance Recovery Boots, and Tech 167 3D Printing for the show support. Thanks to the wife and the kids for letting me get this done as always. And remember, you need to be smooth to be fast. Because if you're not, I'll probably be seeing you deep in the emergency department, maybe even the clinic, having strapping tape thrown wherever it will stick. <laughs>